Right, so we're now on part C of regression video four. And in this part, we're looking at categorical dependent variables. Or in other words, what happens if our Y variable is categorical? So for this section, we're not actually going to be building on the previous models that we've been using up until this point. We're still using the same data set, the same car sales data set. But in this case, we're going to change up our Y and X variables. Here, our Y variable is actually going to be this sold indicator, which equals one if the car is sold and zero if the car did not sell. And our X variable is now actually going to be the price of the car, which is going to be measured in thousands of dollars. So here we have our equation with our Y variable being sold, which is a yes, no variable, and our X variable being a numerical variable, which is the sale price of the car. Now to get a sense of what a regression might look like between these two variables, the first thing we like to do is draw a bit of a scatter plot. And from the data set, we can see that the scatter plot of whether the car sold and the price down here on the x-axis, it looks a bit like this. And that's not a mistake. You can see that there's only two possible outcomes for our y variable, one and zero. So how are we meant to draw a line of best fit through this data? Do we just sort of plonk it on like this? Well, we could do that. And we get some kind of regression output that might look like this with a constant term 0 0.7989 and a coefficient of price, which is negative. In this case, it looks like as the price increases, the chance of selling the car decreases. But in fact, me just saying the word chance of selling the car has already kind of changed our Y variable. No longer is it just a yes, no variable. I'm kind of implying that it's actually the probability of it being sold, which is gonna be our Y variable. So this dotted line here, this orange line is in theory at least, modeling the probability of the car being sold between one and zero. But can you see a problem with this line? There's a theoretical issue about modeling a probability as a Y variable in a linear way like this. So what do you think the estimate will be if the price is say $40,000? What's the probability of that car selling? Well, if you draw your eyes down this line, you'll notice it actually goes into negative territory, which we know for probability sakes just doesn't make sense. So the fact that our Y variable is just a bunch of yes, no's, that's ones and zeros, but we actually want to model the probability implies that we can't just use ordinary least squares regression as we've been using in parts A and B. We're going to have to manipulate this Y variable and use a new technique Let's find out what that is. As we said, currently we have the probability of the car selling as a function of the price. And at the moment, we know this probability of sale should be a range that goes from zero to one. And the midpoint of this range should be 0 0.5. So if you have a 50% chance of the car selling, that's the midpoint of this probability. Now we're gonna turn this into just the letter P to make things easy for us. So P is the probability of sale. But as we saw earlier, the fact that this is limited to zero and one as a range becomes a problem if our estimates start falling outside of that range. For example, when price was really, really high, we got negative probabilities, which was a problem. And the first modification we're going to do to this is divide by one minus P. So P on top is still the probability of sale and one minus P on the bottom is the probability of a car not selling. Now this expression has actually got a name and it's called the odds. So think about what happens if the probability of sale is 50%. We'll have 0.5 on top and we'll also have 0.5 on the bottom. So the odds in this case will be one. Or alternatively, you might hear it said one to one. But say the probability of sale was 80%, that's 0.8. It'll be 0.8 on top divided by 0.2 on the bottom. And you'll get an odds of four, which is four to one. Nonetheless, this odds measure has a, a lower limit of zero. You can't get odds which are less than zero. And the upper limit is actually infinity. I mean, if you think about what happens if the probability is 99%, you're gonna have 0.99 on a very small number. So the odds can get 
to a very, very large number. In fact, as large as you want it to be. Now I've put the midpoint here as one. So here's the range between zero and infinity. And the midpoint is one because when the probability is 50%, the odds are going to be one. So that's gonna be the middle of our distribution. Now this range is a little bit better, but it suffers from two problems. The first is that again, we have this hard limit of zero, which hasn't really corrected for that issue of potentially getting negative estimates for our odds. And the other problem is that this distribution is extremely skewed. The midpoint is one, so if you were to draw this as a curve, it would go up very quickly, and then it would have a very long right tail. Now we touched on this on an earlier video, but in a regression, we like to see variables have a nice symmetrical bell-shaped distribution. It's actually one of the assumptions of regression. We'll explore that a little bit more in later videos, but for the moment, just appreciate that there's a problem with just using odds here because it is asymmetrical. So what we do then is we take the log of the odds, and you might've heard this term before, log odds, but it's super convenient because the range now goes from negative infinity to positive infinity with the midpoint being zero. So again, if you try this probability of being 50%, so remember for the probability scale, the midpoint was 50%. So you'd have 0.5 divided by 0.5, which is gonna be one, and the log of one is zero. So all of a sudden we've converted something that had a range from zero to one to something that now has a range of negative infinity to positive infinity, which is really convenient because now this regression will never create a value of our y variable outside of its scale. And it's also nice and symmetrical about zero. Now this is called a binomial logistic regression. Binomial because you only have two options. You either sell the car or you don't sell the car. Logistic because we have this log odds situation. So whenever you have a log odds, we know that's called logistic or logit. Now I'm just gonna add an extra variable to this to make it a bit more realistic because we don't just have to have price in here as our explanatory variable. We can also put in another variable and let's just say we're using pink slip. So here we have the log odds of whether the car will sell as a function of price and pink slip. Okay, now here's where it gets maybe a little bit advanced, but we can't do this in Excel anymore because it's actually impossible to create this new Y variable. I mean, you only have yeses and nos. How do you create log odds out of just that piece of information? So the way this regression gets estimated is actually through a process called maximum likelihood estimation. Up until this point, we've been using what's called ordinary least squares regression or OLS. But in this case, we're gonna use MLE. But you might wanna check the description of this video because I'm planning on doing some videos on maximum likelihood estimation and generalized linear regressions. So if you're super keen, you can go and dig around for those. But for the moment, let's just presume that this is the output that gets created from this regression. You might notice it looks very similar to the output we've seen before. We've got the coefficients here, 0.396, that represents the intercept beta naught, the estimate for beta naught. The coefficient of price, that's the estimate for beta one, and the coefficient for pink slip is the estimate for beta two. The standard errors are all the same. Now in maximum likelihood estimation, this is no longer a T statistic, it's Z, and the P values are read in exactly the same way. So this tells us that price and pink slip are both significant variables in determining the log odds of sale. So I can, if I wanted to, write out the estimated equation like this, just incorporating those coefficients. Now you'll notice we also have this additional piece of output here, which says OR, and that's short for the odds ratio, which we'll get into in just a second. We've got the 95% confidence intervals as well for that odds ratio, but this sort of grayed out section is gonna be very useful to us in our interpretation. So let's find out how that works. So here again, I've just written the estimated regression equation. If I'm trying to explain the effect of price on the log odds of the car selling, I could use this coefficient minus 0.173. And I could say, right, for a $1,000 increase in the price, don't forget this price variable is measured in thousands of dollars. 
the log odds of selling a car decreases by 0.173, on average, holding all else constant. But what is the log odds of selling the car? That doesn't actually mean anything useful to us, does it? What this odds ratio tells us is the, the multiplicative effect of one extra unit of our X variable on the odds of selling the car. I'll repeat that. It's the multiplicative effect of one extra unit of our X variable on the odds of selling a car. So if price increases by one unit or $1,000, the odds of selling the car will be multiplied by 0.84. In other words, for a $1,000 increase in price, the odds of selling the car decreases by 16%. So, whereas the coefficients we're dealing with log odds, this odds ratio figure will essentially unlog that Y variable, so we can deal in odds, which is much more interpretable than log odds. And realistically, all it does is it takes the coefficient and raises it into the power of the exponential function. So that's e to the power of negative 0.173. Now, how about we interpret the effect of having a pink slip? Again, we can interpret it in terms of log odds by saying, well, if we have a pink slip, the log odds would increase by 1.555. But if we want to interpret this in terms of odds, we can just look at the odds ratio here and say, well, cars with a pink slip have 4.73 times the odds of being sold compared to cars without a pink slip, on average, holding all else constant. So it seems like they have a much greater advantage of being sold if you have a pink slip, right? So to summarize, the coefficients tell us the effect of the X variable on the log odds and the OR or odds ratio column tells us the effect of the X variable on the odds. Now, this brings me to an important point. We use words like chance and probability and odds almost interchangeably. And it's okay to use chance and probability interchangeably. They mean the same thing, but they mean something different to the word odds. So be very careful when dealing with odds because they're not the same thing as raw probability. And here's a clear example to show you why that's the case. If I told you that the probability of rain tomorrow is 20%, we all understand what that means. It means that we have a fifth of a chance of it raining tomorrow. But what are the odds of rain tomorrow? Well, the odds have a very particular definition. The odds are in fact the probability divided by one minus the probability as we've just seen. So the odds of it raining tomorrow is actually 0.25. Or another way of saying this is one to four, meaning that we have one chance of it raining for every four chances of it not raining. Okay, so with that done, I'm gonna throw it over to you. Here's that output again that we've created from that last regression. I'm giving you three questions here, and I promise you if you do these questions honestly, it'll start solidifying some of these concepts for you. So have a go at trying to find the answer to A, B, and C, where we're asked, to find the probability that a $4,500 car with a pink slip will sell. Part B asks for the same car without a pink slip. And then I want you in part C to calculate the odds of each of those cars selling and find the odds ratio between the two. So pause the video and give that a go. All the information you need is provided in this table above here. but I'm going to continue now and show you the answer. So to find the probability that a $4,500 car with a pink slip will sell, we know that the equation looks a little bit like this. We're just putting in the coefficients from the table into a linear equation here. Now, for, four, for a $4,500 car, we're going to sub in 4.5 for that value of price because it's in thousands of dollars. And we're also gonna sub in the value of one for pink slip. So let's find that probability. We know that the log odds is 1.1725 if you actually calculate this expression. Now what we need to do is we need to exponentiate both sides to find the odds and that happens to equal 3.23. And if we rearrange this equation, multiplying both sides by one minus P, 
just doing a little bit of algebra. Hopefully that's not too advanced for you. The probability itself turns out to be 0.764. So a car that's worth $4,500, if it has a pink slip, it has a 76.4% chance of selling. Now to find the probability that a $4,500 car without a pink slip will sell, you could do exactly the same thing, except you're subbing in zero for that pink slip variable. So I'm not gonna show you the calculations for those. Hopefully you'll be able to do that, but the answer is just gonna be 40.6%. So here we've generated probabilities from this log odds equation. We've rearranged our Y variable to give us just that P, which represents probability. Now here's the interesting bit. In part C, we're gonna see if we can find the odds of sale for each of these. And I've created a little bit of a table to help us do that. So here we're asked to calculate the odds in parts A and B and find the odds ratio. So here's parts A and B. The car for part A was $4,500 with a pink slip and for part B it did not have a pink slip. The probability in each situation was provided in that previous page, 76.4% and 40.6%. So if that's the probability, the odds of sale for each of those is calculated by taking the probability and dividing by one minus that probability. So the odds of sale for the car in part A was 3.23 and the odds of sale for the car in part B was 0 0.68. Now let's see what the odds ratio would be. Well, that's going to be the odds from the car in part A divided by the odds from the car in part B. This means that having a pink slip for the same value of a car, $4,500, having a pink slip multiplied our odds by 4.73. So our odds were 0.68 of sale without the pink slip but with a pink slip, it's 3.23. In other words, we have an odds ratio of 4.73. Now, have you seen that number before? Remember our output? Have a look at that number there, 4.73. It's no surprise that we got this answer here because what we've done is manually compared a car with a pink slip to a car without a pink slip, holding price constant. And that's exactly how we're meant to interpret this odds ratio figure from the output. But that draws to a close, regression part four. Keep a look out for regression part five, where we deal with all of the assumptions underlying regression. Things like the normality of error terms, homoscedasticity, which is a great word, isn't it? Uncorrelated errors. And we'll also look at the issue of multicollinearity. Nonetheless, I hope you found all of this useful and if you have, feel free to subscribe to the channel where you can keep in touch through any of these ways. It's called Z Statistics and my name is Justin Zeltzer. See you around.